But one thing I didn't expect to happen on my Camino was meeting someone who was friends with Jack Nicholson. But it happened. So this is Derry from Kerry. I met him in a place called Burget, which is famous for Ernest Hemingway staying there. And he uh, asked me how far Espinal was. I'm not very good at reading maps, but it looked really close. So I just said to him, it's just around the corner. It's only 500 metres away. Unfortunately, it was five kilometres away. So when I arrived there about an hour later, he was waiting for me on the bench, teasing me, having a good laugh. He was such a character. So David from Kerry is from, obviously from Ireland. He emigrated to the States about 30 years ago, where he became a very successful actor. And he's appeared in lots of Broadway shows and some blockbuster movies, including uh, The Departed with Jack Nicholson and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. He was on first name terms with them. And he also appeared on Gangs of New York. So he's an Irish pilgrim and uh, he's a bit of a bad influence on me because the first night he introduced me to some other Irish friends and I'm afraid I got very drunk. I arrived back in the albergue about two o'clock. The, the normal rules about 10 o'clock curfew don't apply because it was a campsite. Oh, I fell over a bag and he put the light on. It was pandemonium and other pilgrims were not best pleased. But to make matters worse, the next door cubicle was full of 10 year old crazy Spanish children who thought it was hilarious. So they started clapping and laughing and I think I got to bed about five o'clock two hours sleep, not really best preparation for a long walk. Uh, we walked together the next day for a couple of hours and departed alongside Zubiri where there's a beautiful bridge. So we waved each other goodbye. I wished him the best and I never saw him again. I often wonder what happened to him. So uh, you take care my friend, Derry and Kerry. What a character. So I'd made friends with a young man from Germany called Paul who spoke impeccable English like most of them do. We walked towards Pamplona and across the city. It took hours, it seemed to go on forever. And uh, we were heading for a place called Ziri Giri Thai. I'm sorry, I just can't pronounce it any better. It's a Basque word with all Zs and Xs in it. And uh, before we got there, uh, the we were walking up this quite steep hill and the sky turned black and it started torrential rain. It was absolutely awful. When we got to our albergue, which is called San Andras, there was a German lady, middle-aged lady called Melanie, trying to speak to him, but there was a bit of a language problem. So she explained to Paul in German, he explained to me in English and I tried my best to explain to the guy behind the counter what the problem was and it was this so Melanie was trying to walk the Camino with a dog Nebby and carrying a tent a bag weighed it was huge it weighed about I think it must have been about 20 kilos how on earth she ever carried it I'll never know and uh, she was basically pitching a tent wherever she felt just in a field near a town and she'd all right the first two or three nights but she obviously couldn't go out in that storm so I explained this to the guy he just took her out to his house where there was a veranda with a really good roof and told her to sleep there. It was really quite wonderful. And this sort of thing happens a lot on the Camino. He even brought her uh, coffee and biscuits and, and water for the dog. So the next morning we see her. She's in really high spirits. And she said to me, Mike, what can I do to help you? You know, it was really kind of you last night. I said to her, Melanie, my back's sore. The only thing I need is a physiotherapist. So she said to me, oh, well, guess what my job is? I'm a physiotherapist in Düsseldorf and uh, my speciality is backs. So I lied on the floor and she put some cream on. She said she knew what the problem was and she manipulated my back and it felt so good. And with that, we just set off. We went to the uh, Hill of Forgiveness and uh, we were heading for Puente La Reina, the Queen's Bridge, where we met a crazy Australian who trained for the Camino by ballroom dancing.
So the next morning, Paul, Melanie, the dog Nebby and myself headed off for the Hill of Forgiveness, which wasn't very far away. It was quite a steep climb, beautiful views. And we arrived in a beautiful town called Puente La Reina, the Queen's Bridge. A beautiful medieval town with narrow streets. You could be in a, on a set of Game of Thrones. I half expected uh, the Dragon Queen to fly, a, fly across. So we were sitting down on this square on the outskirts and this guy starts walking towards us. It was like crippled and we almost phoned an ambulance. We asked him to sit down. Oh, I'm struggling with blisters, he said. So Melanie's obviously in the medical profession, so she offered to help him. So he took his boots off. And the problem was obvious right away. His boots were two sizes too small for him. Um, so Paul said to him, uh, have you any other shoes? He said, I've just got these sandals. So Paul got the boots and just threw them in his bin. So uh, Melanie continued to work on uh, his blisters. And uh, where are we, Mike? I said, uh, well, if you give me your map, I'll show you. Map? I haven't got a map. Uh, well, what about your phone? Let me have your phone. I'll, I'll show you on the phone. I haven't got a phone. It was an absolute hoot. I said to him, how old are you? He said, oh, 81. I said, oh, you seem quite fit. How did you, how far did you walk? Did you train? Walk? Oh, no, I do ballroom dancing. That's, that's, that's got me really fit. I've never met anyone like him before. So, he was feeling a lot better. He put his uh, socks on and his uh, sandals. Thanked us, bought us a cup of coffee. And we found out later, after I returned home, that John arrived in Santiago in 26 days. He's 81 years old. It must be a record. And if that wasn't bad enough, if that wasn't impressive enough, he uh, carried on to Finisterre. So 800 kilometres clearly is not enough for him. Uh, so there is a real Camino hero of mine. And just one little thought. Um, he ended up turned up at my house last year. I'll tell you a bit about that later on. Uh, completely unannounced, just knocked on the door about half past seven in the morning. And we spent about an hour together. And that's the sort of magic of the Camino.
Something incredible happened today. It was my first miracle. It was an unbelievable experience and I'll know I'll never forget today as long as I live. So here's what happened. There are two topics of conversation on the Camino. Blisters and snoring. So we'll talk a bit about snoring later on. I was having a really, really bad time today. I've got four blisters. I'm alone, I'm cold, I'm tired, I'm hungry. I arrive in a place called Viana, a very pretty small town. It was a bank holiday. All the shops were closed, the restaurants were closed. I walked to the town in no time at all, or rather limped. Got to the other side, I looked in front of me and all I could see was countryside as far as the eye could see. I was desperate for the rest and for something to eat. Suddenly a young boy rode past on his bike. I asked him whether, if there was a restaurant open, he pointed to somewhere just around the corner, I just couldn't quite see it. The name was El Cajon de Pan, which means bread basket. I sat down and ordered a meal, feeling very sorry for myself. And in walks this guy slightly older than me. His name was Joe. He sat down, introduced himself. He was quite a character. He was softly spoken, had like an, a, a, a sort of strength about him, and a, a confidence. It was hard, it's hard to describe. He just seemed to speak with a lot of authority, very quietly. He asked me how I was and I told him about my problem with my blisters and he said let me have a look so I took my shoes and socks off. He put some Vaseline on, nothing much, in a couple of minutes it was all over and he just told me to put my shoes and socks back on which I did. We talked for a few more minutes, he was really engaging company. Then he got up to leave. He beckoned me to stand up alongside him. He stared at me in the face, held my hand, squeezed it tightly. And he said, Mike, I've seen something inside you. You will arrive in Santiago safely and you'll have no more problems with your blisters. And he went and I sat down, I drank my coffee. I couldn't take in what had happened. It was, it was just so strange, really mysterious. And I had my, I had my meal, I, I waited for a while, had another cup of coffee and set off to walk. And do you know what? Couldn't feel a thing. No pain whatsoever. It was just all so weird. I, after a, a kilometre or so, I sat down on a bench. I took my shoes and socks off to examine what had happened. They were all still there. They looked exactly the same. No pain. Just like this tingling sensation that I had all day in my feet. It was really weird. I was so lifted, so energised. So I carried on walking. It was so easy. I walked to the Grogno where I stayed for the night and, and that was uh, something I'll never forget. Now, the other sad thing about this, what the time was I was so disappointed that I thought I might not see him again. I wanted to see Father Joe again. And Father Joe was from Ireland. I just would love to have seen him and talked to him and thanked him. But he was way ahead of me. He walked really quickly and Unbelievably, as if one miracle isn't enough, I walked to the middle of Burgos and there he is, a city with 180,000 people in and there's Father Joe. So I hugged him, I thanked him, I bought him his lunch and we sat down and chatted, he was such good company and then he waved goodbye and I've never seen him since. I don't know where he's, where he's from, I know he's from Connemara in Ireland but I've no details of him. And that was one of the greatest days of my life. Now, I hear you all saying, oh, I'm not sure about that, it must be making it up. Do you know what? I couldn't care less. I was there. I felt it. It was real. And I'll never forget it.
It was another beautiful day on the Camino today, but I didn't get off to such a good start. I walked past a beautiful golf course called Rioja Alta. Now I've played golf all, all my, most of my life and I somehow rather got it in my head that it'd be a nice experience to play nine holes of golf, to hire some golf clubs. So I walked into the reception, asked if I could do that. And the lady didn't, wasn't very happy and she just pointed to the door, she didn't actually say anything. Apparently, as a scruffy, smelly, dirty, muddy pilgrim, I didn't quite pass their dress code. I stayed in a beautiful city tonight called Santa Domingo de la Calzada. And a few kilometres away, I'd met a very good pilgrim friend of mine called uh, Spencer from Australia. He was uh, a real character and uh, I would meet into him several times uh, through the course of my pilgrimage. And now this place is quite famous because uh, something that happened 800 years ago, some miracle, uh, meant that a chicken is very revered. So in the church there, for the last 800 years, there's been a live chicken uh, for 800 years. Quite a story. Uh, so on the outskirts of the town, we could hear some beautiful music playing, beautiful folk music. And as we got towards the town centre, it stopped. And when we got there, we found out that a fiesta had been going on. There's a lot of fiestas in Spain. So I spoke to some, some musicians who were dressed so smart in their uh, La Rioja gear and asked them what had happened and they said they'd just finished. But he said, would you like us to play for you? So obviously we said yes and then eight or nine people got their instruments out and played for us for several minutes. It was uh, quite a moving experience. Now this caused quite a lot of commotion and suddenly there was about 50 people around us clapping the musicians there. Everyone loved it. They had a fantastic time. And then when they stopped, we all clapped them, and then they started clapping us, because pilgrims are very uh, respected and revered on the Camino, and then they hugged us and wished as well, and then this guy appeared with a chain round his neck, who I took to be the mayor, El Alcalde, and he also wished us when Camino and hugged us. So uh, that was quite an experience, I'll never forget that.
something magical happened today. You know what? I think it's another miracle. It's either a miracle, it's certainly God's influence on my Camino, it's supernatural, it's miraculous. If it's not any of those things, it's a 1 in 10 million chance. So you believe me or not. Here's what happened. So I set off from Burgos about 8 o'clock. I think I was the last pilgrim outside the hall of the albergue. Walked past the city, the, the, walked past the cathedral, a beautiful cathedral. Saw my first storks on the roof high up on one of the church spires. And just outside the town there's a small place called Bial Bia. And just through the other side, there was a yellow path of the Camino in front of me. And on the side, something just caught my eye. And it was really like a bright, shining light. It was like something, someone was shining a torch on my face. It was sort of underneath some overhanging grass. And I picked it up and it was a credit card. And I was about to throw it away and something inside me said, just keep it, not throw it away, just keep it. It's like a voice inside my head. And so I put it in my wallet, I thought nothing else of it. Carried on walking for another seven or eight hours. I think I walked another 25 kilometers. I walked past various different villages, Tandojas, or Nios, and many, many dozens of different albergues. And arrived at quite a pretty town called Ontanas, which is quite well known because if you're quite tired, it's usually the end of a long day. And it's in a valley and you can't see it till you're only literally about 200 metres away from it. It's a very pretty place, so there's three albergues there. I walked in the middle of the town, turned to my right, I could see a uh, name of one was called El, El Pontido. So I went to the receptionist, uh, got my wallet out to pay my money and got the credit card out. And I just said to the receptionist, I showed her the name on the card and I said, there isn't anyone with this name staying here is the surely. She just looked at me, she didn't speak. She looked a bit shocked and she just pointed outside. Went outside, there's this group of young men looking a bit down in the dumps. And I said, oh, is anyone called this here? This guy just stood up. That's me, he said. He shook his head, he was like shocked, he couldn't speak. Thank you, thank you, how can I repair you? Anyway, it seems that he was considering abandoning his uh, his walk because uh, he just didn't have any money there was no way for paying for anything he was in a complete state so hooked me, bought me a few drinks told me he'd never forget me and I uh, had a lovely evening that night with with Spencer and uh, my two American friends Jeannie and Marthy and it was just the end of a magical day so, Miracle 2 what do you think? So here is another Camino hero, a very special person, a very, very important part of my pilgrimage, a special friend, my mentor. He did everything for me. He's my rock. One of the most special people I've ever met in my life. His name is Kazim. He's a Russian. I've seen him before. I always seem to be surrounded by people he had this charisma about him. He was like the Pied Piper of the Camino. He was so charming and friendly. Everyone loved him. So we met in the morning in a cafe called El Jardin on a, quite a nice town called Castro Jerez. We hit it off right away. I knew we would. The Spanish say, Nos llevamos muy bien. He started calling me his dad in the first day that we met. And you know, that's the thing about the Camino. It, it kind of squeezes time. You're walking along, you've known someone an hour and you think you've known them all your life. And that's how people unburden themselves with problems that they speak about. The innermost thoughts, there's like a trust there. We're all in the same boat together, one foot in front of the other. No one knows if you've got any money, if you've got a big car, if you've got a big house, we're all the same. So Kazim was very special. 
So I walked into this cafe and we started chatting. And he went to buy me a coffee. He was in the middle of a text conversation with his wife. It was uh, Elizabeth, who was 4,000 kilometers away in Moscow. So while he was at the bar, I picked up the phone and started having a com- press, um, text conversation with her in English. And she was an English teacher, so that was no problem. And when he came, I told her that I'd look after him and she didn't need to worry about him. She seemed quite taken by it. And uh, I know that then we ended up spending the rest of the day together. Uh, we walked together, we talked about lots of different things. He was so clever, he was so bright. And I know I'll never, ever forget him as long as I live. And around 10 days later on the Cruz de Ferro, he saved my life. Um, he helped me when I was uh, really, really needed it, when I was in a really, really low point. Um, and that's the very special thing about the Camino. So thank you, Kazim. You take care, my friend.
Anna is a very special friend. She's an English teacher at a local college at a town called Peña Mayor. And I spent all today with her and the students, helping them with their English. It was a really lovely experience. As a pilgrim, I was kind of a bit um, of a favourite of theirs. They made quite a fuss of me. Uh, they couldn't believe someone as old as me could attempt to walk across Spain. Um, one of them, uh, I asked one of them how old they thought I was, and she said 82. Um, anyway, I had a lovely day. Now this is Mara and Twitter. Uh, now I've been to Anna's house I think four times before. I've never heard Mara bark, uh, sh bark once. She's a very gentle dog. All she does all day is sleep. Until now. So last night I went to bed about half ten, hoping for a good night's sleep. And unfortunately I didn't get one. Not long after I went to sleep, there was a lot of commotion going on behind a house. And uh, this time of year apparently, in the spring, there's some sort of migration of boar and deer. And uh, Mara took offence to it for some reason. And so she barked all night. I got to sleep about half five. And now I can't wait to get back to the more familiar sounds of snorers and doors banging and sneezing and coughing of the albergues. But still, I had a lovely time. Thanks, Anna. I caught the train back from Oviedo early in the morning and I got back safely to, to Leon. Uh, it was a really beautiful trip. And what was about to happen to me was, again, one of the greatest days of my life. This is your story, an incredible story. And if you don't cry when you've heard it, you ain't got a soul. So here's what's happened. So I'm sat in the middle of Leon in front of its beautiful cathedral and there's a music festival going on there's lots of children dancing and laughing having a nice time hundreds of them wearing red bandanas and white t-shirts and the lady came up to me and she just said to me are you Mike are you the guy who writes those cool posts now I haven't told you this but I actually started writing a blog quite early on and it was getting shared through various Facebook groups and I was actually being followed by thousands of people all over the world, including pilgrims that were on the Camino now. So it was quite often people would come up to me that were all following me and ask me how I am. And uh, so Jo had done that. So she said to me, I want you to tell my story. I have a story to tell that can save people's lives. If they trust in God, he can save you. So we sat down together on a bench surrounded by these children. We held hands she, and she opened her heart out to me. We cried a lot. So that this is her story. So Jo is a successful businesswoman from New Zealand. She's a power lifter, actually all, holds world records. She's an incredible woman. But she had this dark secret, she said, this blackness inside her. And every now and then this mood would just overpower her. She just couldn't get rid of it. She tried to kill herself. She told me that when she was eight years old, she went into the garage in the garden and opened up a bottle of tomato fertilizer and swallowed it to try and kill herself. It was all a very overwhelming experience for me. So Jo was a devout Christian. She told me she'd had this problem for 48 years and she'd come to the Camino for an answer like many of us have. She was searching for the truth, searching for God to come inside her. And he did. He answered her prayers. So at first, things didn't go well. She'd walked from France to Lyon and found no answers. She wanted to meet a priest. She couldn't. The priest couldn't speak English. She thought God had, I think she thought God had abandoned her. But then she, and she was going to quit. So she was about to make plans to fly back to New Zealand. And uh, 
she decided to get a tattoo. And she's in this tattoo studio telling her the story, the same story I'm sharing with you up to this point, to an artist who couldn't speak English, but they managed to get through to each other. She said it was a very emotional thing. And she was getting a tattoo to hide some quite ugly white lines on her wrists where she tried to harm herself. So she said to me, Mike, as soon as a needle left my arm, God came inside me. She squeezed my hand tight as she was telling me the story. He came inside me. He took all this evil away, this blackness I had inside me all this time. Her eyes was like, were lighting up. And she said, I know I'm all right now. It's all gone. It's never, ever going to come back again. I just know I'm strong. Please share this story with people. Believe in God and he can save you. So we hugged each other one last time. She thanked me. She said goodbye and then she was gone. She was lost among the crowd of dancing children and I just didn't know what to make of it all. Please tell my story was the last thing she said to me. I want the world to know the power of God. So I sat on the bench for quite some time trying to compose myself. I mean, how can you overcome something like that? And yes, it was another miracle. So I set off walking. I couldn't have any enthusiasm at all. I couldn't think. I was overwhelmed by it all. And after only three or four miles, I stopped on this motorway, the N120, um, where I just stopped at a cafe called uh, Casa Dobi, right next to a car showroom, Hyundai car showroom, I remember it. And I sat down, had a coffee, and start, opened up my four-inch iPhone and started to write it, and the words just came. And within an hour, I'd written 2,000 words, and it all seemed quite reasonable and quite an interesting story. It was all so overwhelming. And so I posted it on Facebook, as I'd done all the other days. Um, and then I started walking again. Again, I just so overwhelmed, and uh, I only managed to walk 11 kilometers to the. I stopped at a place called Balberde de la Berchine. Um It was the shortest length I'd walked on my entire Camino. And early that night, I got a message from Jo thanking me for the story. She was really pleased with what I'd done, which was so relieving to me. And we're still in contact today. She's safe and well and happy and no bad thoughts. So Jo, thank you for sharing your thoughts with me. I hope we've helped people. I'm sure we have. My favourite pilgrim. God bless you, Jo.
So I'd only walked about 50 metres from the small hill where we'd been watching that incredible sunset. I could hear this voice, Mike, Mike. There's no mistake in it, of course, it was Kazim. And you couldn't miss him, he was so tall and imposing, and he always wore this blue bobble hat whatever time of day it was, whatever the weather was like. So we walked together towards the cross, and it's not very far at all. We got there around before seven o'clock. There was a small group of pilgrims around it, so we, we waited, and then no time at all, they were gone. And the cross was alone, and we were just looking at it, staring at it for what seemed quite a long time. I wasn't sure what to do, and Kazim grabbed hold of me and moved me towards the cross, helped me very sort of gently. Then he moved towards the cross himself, he, he put his own stone down and he held his arms out and he started speaking in Russian, which I obviously couldn't understand. I found out later he was saying a prayer for his grandmother and a prayer for one of his best friends that died of a heroin overdose in Moscow a few years before. And then he turned round to me, wasn't sure what to say or what to do, I wasn't coping very well. And he just got hold of my hand and moved me towards the cross and I was right in front of it, I could have reached out and touched it. And I said a prayer, I put my stone down. I just didn't really know what to do. I stared at these two pictures I told you about before. My mother and father and my best friend, Steve Neep, who died in 2016. And Kazim just took hold of them. He, he had this sort of sense for pilgrims. He could tune into when they needed help and when to do the right thing. He's a very sort of compassionate person. So he took the pictures and the pins I brought with me to pin them on the cross. And he reached up with those great big long arms of his, so much higher than anybody else's. The guy was uh, is very tall. And then he pinned them on and then he turned around and looked very pleased with himself stared at me and just gave the, this great big smile and we looked at each other and then we stepped back turned round and walked away and that was it now I'd expected to feel depressed but I didn't I, f I felt uplifted it was so weird and I couldn't get out of my head how special Steve was how important it was to me the things he did for me so let me tell you some things about him. So Steve was a kind man, a man without arrogance. Everyone loved him. When he died, there were 600 people at his funeral and at least 100 outside. The priest said afterwards he'd never seen anything like it before. So Steve could just do anything. He was so popular. He could play football, he could run, he could do anything. But his great gift was dancing. He loved soul music. He introduced me to soul music. And he used to love Edwin Starr and the Contours, Mitch Ryder. And he met his wife when she was 14. You'd often see them at the dance halls in, in the uh, youth clubs around Barrow, our hometown, when we were 16, 17. And he, he'd be there with Diane dancing in the middle and there'd be a circle of people around him. And you could see all the young teenagers looking at him, wanting to be like him, wanting to be as cool as him. But of course, none of us could. But it was, he was untouched by it all. He was not arrogant about anything. He didn't really know how great he was. That, that was kind of his, just his temperament. So I started walking with all this very... I just felt so happy, so joyful. And Kazim was about 50 metres behind me. And after a few minutes, there was a tap on my shoulder. Are you OK, Mike? He said. I said, yeah, I'm fine. And that was it, we just clicked back into the normal topics of conversation, probably snoring or banging doors or blisters. And that was the end of my experience of the Cruz de Ferro. And uh, it was a, it's another remarkable thing that's happened to me on this amazing Camino and I just know my life will never be the same again.
This is Ron, and he was an incredible and inspirational person. He was a senior officer in the Israeli army, and he's the sort of person you just liked instantly. He wasn't all jokes and life and soul of the party, not like Kazim. He was kind of understated, but he had a kindness inside him, a sort of sense of goodness, a warmth. You could just feel it whenever you were with him. Now, he had the biggest bag I'd ever seen on the Camino. To me, he looked like he was carrying a parachute, but it didn't seem to trouble him at all. He was so strong, such a powerful person. So he'd just stop on the side of the road when he felt like it. He'd open up that great big bag of his and start producing various things, pots and pans. He had some, sort of, some kind of gas heater. And he would start to brew delicious Israeli coffee that he'd brought back from him from Jerusalem. He seemed to have unlimited supplies of it. And I always remember seeing him, he'd always be surrounded by people who were sort of drawn to him, possibly by the smell of this coffee. But people just let, like spending time with him. And he, he was never alone, he always had plenty of people around him. So we didn't walk together for that long, all in total, perhaps only about three or four hours over two or three days. And hadn't seen him for a while, I was sort of losing, I thought I might not see him again. And there's, I was starting to miss him. Now there's a saying on the Camino, goes along the lines of, whatever you want, the Camino will provide it, or something like that. And three days later, there he was in front of the cathedral. And he had a special present for me, and I'll just treasure it forever. So Ron, wherever you are, you're always in my prayers.
someone once asked me what my favourite picture was from the 800 odd that I took on my Camino. Well, this is it. So what you're looking at is a family, Jean-Marc and Teresa from Luxembourg and with their children, 21 months old baby, toddler and a seven week old baby. I, I just couldn't believe it when I met them that they could do this. So they'd walked from Ponferrada, a distance of 160 kilometers, using some kind of makeshift cross between like a wheelbarrow and a bike. I just don't know how they did it. But they did. And you know what? They made it to the Santiago too. I met them there. What an amazing family. The Camino just keeps on bringing up all these surprises. I was so excited this morning as we got nearer to the cathedral. But I was also a little bit sad because I hadn't seen Kazim for quite a number of days and I wanted to share our great day together. He'd done so much for me, he'd helped me through so many things. But I had received a text message last night from his wife Elizabeth to say that he was determined to be there to meet me even though if he was going to get there he would have to walk. Uh, 50 kilometers so I'll keep my fingers crossed that he's there waiting for me. <music> Father Sergio presented me with my credentials at the pilgrim office. He spoke really slowly and clear Spanish. I could follow him quite easily. And he said to me, we, we're always asked a question there, all the pilgrims, why did you do your pilgrimage? And I said to him, quiero sentirme más cerca a Dios, which means I wanted to feel closer to God. He smiled and shook my hands and wished me all the best. And another fantastic moment for me. And as soon as I walked out of the beautiful building, who was waiting for me? But Kazim, you just couldn't miss him with that blue bobble hat. So we hugged and headed for the cathedral and it was one of the greatest days of my life. The plaza in front of the cathedral was something else. My One of my best friends, Mark, a retired fire officer, told me it'd be like this, but I hadn't expected it. Everywhere you looked, there were people you knew pilgrims you'd shared special moments with. It was all so magical, I know I'll never forget it. Everywhere you looked, it was just people shaking hands and hugging. It was like a communal spirit, a warmth, a feeling of shared accomplishment. We'd all walked, most of us had walked 800 kilometers right across the country. And uh, it was just so wonderful to share that moment with everybody.
a very old bishop made a sermon at the cathedral and he spoke very clearly and I got the drift of it which was along the lines of welcome pink pilgrims may God go with you remember you know the importance of not having anything weighty in your lives so use your bags as a metaphor for life when you get back home get rid of the things that are weighing you down get rid of the hate the selfishness the arrogance the jealousy and become better people when I look round I can see some Spanish pilgrims who are actually crying In your cabino it's easy to forget why we're here you see so many amazing things the rivers and mountains the cathedral cities the castles and you forget so who was saint jim because without him none of this would exist this town would be a sleepy village with a few hundred people not a massive city with hundreds of thousands of people among the greatest cathedrals in the world so saint james was one of jesus's first disciples and he's the patron saint of Spain and Portugal and he was beheaded by King Herod in 44 AD and yes I am reading this out of a book I didn't know this so it's easy to forget it I have one last story to share with you, one last example of amazing kindness and love and generosity that's unique to the Camino and the whole world, that amazing part of northern Spain I know I'll never forget. So you're looking at a picture of a Camino hero of mine called John. We met at the Puente La Reina, the Queen's Bridge early on. He had no phone, no map, got fit for the Camino by ballroom dancing and he had five blisters, he was in a right state. You know what we found out later on? That he arrived in Santiago in 26 days, he's 81 years old, quite remarkable. Now we swapped email addresses, uh, like you often do, but he doesn't do emails, he doesn't do forms. I didn't even know he knew what an email was. Um, and phone numbers, of course. Um, so, I never expected to hear from him again. But last year, 2019, 6.30 in the morning, the phone rings. Hi Mike, it's John. John, John who? John, you met on the Camino. You must remember me. So, I realised right away who it was. 
So he said he was in a place he couldn't pronounce, it's called Theatha. He's at the station there, would we pick him up? So apparently he'd gone back to do the Camino again with his partner Heather. It had drawn him back like it does all of us. He got to Burgos and suddenly got inside his head that he had to see me. And here he was, no warning or anything. So I went to pick him up. We spent four wonderful days together, reminiscing we had a party for him. And there was still yet another gift. So many of you will know I, I brought a book out. It was just an e-book, it was a small budget thing. It's a very crowded market. There's hundreds, perhaps thousands of books out there. But you know, people who read it uh, seem to enjoy it. The last time I looked, there were 70 reviews on Amazon and 68 of them were five stars. The other two were four stars and one of them was from an American who said, I knocked a star off because you didn't like Donald Trump. Yeah, well, I'll own up to that, that's for sure. And so John kept saying to me, Mike, I want you to bring it out as a proper book. He said he didn't do Kindles. I'll pay for it, please. Let me help you. Of course, I, I didn't do that. So I waved goodbye to him at the station. Wished him well. He's a very special person. And when I got back home, there was an envelope on his pillow with a lovely note telling me how much he thought of me. I will never forget me. With quite a large amount of money in. And the message said, I want to give this book to my grandchildren and family. Please bring it out as what he referred to as a proper book. So I did. And it's done and it's available now. So all told, total, I think I spent two hours with him and that's the magic of the Camino. It accelerates relationships. And it's John, I'll never forget you. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your friendship. And uh, stay well, my friend. God bless.